Hi everybody, I'm Greg Fischel. Welcome to bonus weather video number two for this week. I wanted to try to sneak as many of these uh, in as I can uh, before I am uh, detained at a medical facility later this week. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about, uh, about fronts and some interesting things about fronts intensifying and fronts weakening and all that sort of stuff. So let us move on here and we're first going to start off with some definitions. And the first one is, what is a front? Well, it's a transition zone between two air masses of different density. That just actually comes from the American Meteorological Society glossary, okay? And a, you know, a lot of us think of a front, and this is partially true, as being that line where the wind shifts and you can feel the cold air beginning to come in. But the front itself is really just the leading edge of the transition to colder weather. In fact, as I'll show you in just a little bit here, we actually refer to these transition zones as frontal zones, as opposed to being just a single line. It's actually a band, if you will. So we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. And then, of course, the word genesis means the origin of or origin or coming into being. And so if you think about the book of Genesis and the Bible, the beginning, okay? So uh, if you combine these two words, then you have the word frontogenesis, which is the beginning or the intensification of a front. So let's suppose you have a situation where there's really not that much temperature contrast over a given region, but then over time, cold air starts to come in from the north, warm air comes up from the south, and all of a sudden you've got a pretty good temperature gradient, and so that would be an example of frontogenesis. Frontolysis is exactly the opposite. It's the end or the weakening of a front. So the amount of temperature contrast would actually decrease over time. Now, when a cold front passes, as I just mentioned, it only marks the leading edge of the transition zone to the colder air. We refer to that zone as a frontal zone. And most, if not all, of the temperature contrast with any front is associated or is on the cold side of the boundary, okay? So if you think about it, and I'll tell you what, let me go to the next graphic here, and then I think I can show this a little bit more clearly. So here's your typical mid-latitude cyclone. Let's start off with an area of low pressure here. We've got the cold front off to the south and west, and we've got the warm front off toward the, uh, toward the north and east. So again, right in here, is the line where you'll get the wind shift once these boundaries or fronts move through you. But in general, this entire area here is referred to as the warm sector. So it's uniformly or almost uniformly warm all through here. And then as soon as you get north of this boundary here, then it starts to get colder, but it's a progressive thing where the farther you go north of this boundary, the colder it gets. And then eventually, if you get far enough up in here, then it's uniformly cold up in here too. But this region between the uniformly warm air and the uniformly cold air is called the frontal zone, okay? And this would be the area that, again, extends all along the front on the cold side of that boundary. Okay. So how does this all occur? Well, I put three isotherms up here. These are three lines of equal temperature, okay? So you can assign values if you'd like to, like maybe the, this one here is 25, and this is 30, and this is 35. It can be anything you want, but these are lines of equal temperature. Now, let's impose a certain kind of a wind field on this, where we're gonna have northerly winds up in here, and down here, we're going to have southerly winds. So that's going to move these isotherms of this one northward, and it's going to move this one southward, okay? And so as a result, the isotherms start to become packed a little bit more tightly, and you have more temperature contrast now over the same distance than you did before. So now another way of looking at this is looking at a cross-section. Now a little bit of review here real quick. We've talked before about how the distance between two surfaces of constant pressure, okay? The distance between those two surfaces is proportional to the temperature of the air between them. So this is a constant pressure surface at 500 millibars. This is a constant pressure surface at 700 millibars. The two lines are closest together here, so this air is cold and relatively warm here where the lines are farther apart. Now, if you have frontogenesis going on, then what's going to happen is that you're going to make those lines tilt 
more severely, okay, because the temperature contrast is actually increasing. So the 500 millibar may tilt up something like this, the 700 millibar tilts something like this, and now instead of it being just a little warm to a little cold, it's very warm to rather cold, okay? And because this line is tilted more, if you took a look at a horizontal line here, the pressure gradient force, which drives the wind, is going to be stronger, okay? Because now you've got pressures much higher than 500 millibars here, much lower than 500 millibars here, and so that's going to strengthen the wind blowing in this direction. And the opposite down here, the, the pressure gradient is stronger, so the wind is going to be blowing like this from high to low pressure, okay? So what this is going to do is set up a circulation where you have you know, westerly winds aloft, if you will, up here, and then the air sinks where it's cold, and then you have a return flow in the low levels, and then it rises on the warm side of the boundary. And generally, if you take a look at a weather map and you see zones of frontogenesis, then the heaviest precipitation will end up falling just on the south side of where that frontogenesis is occurring, on the warm side of where that process is going on. And when you've heard about lake effect snow and this type of thing, you can get uh, some of these uh, what we call mesoscale snow bands, okay, uh, that are very, very difficult to predict. It's, it's very dependent on wind direction, and if the wind goes from 240 degrees to 250 degrees, all of a sudden that band shifts 10 miles, and the people that were getting huge amounts of snow before now are getting nothing, and the people that weren't getting anything before are getting a lot. And you can also have this process going on with any storm across the United States. And a lot of times, instead of having a uniformly heavy snow area, you'll see these bands, these mesoscale bands, where it'll be snowing harder than it is on either side of it. And it is this very process here that contributes to those locally heavy snow areas that are almost impossible to predict ahead of time. You may see, say that, okay, this is a setup where we're likely to have bands, but exactly where those bands set up, that is still a very, very difficult thing to do. All right, I know that was a lot, but I hope at least a little of it makes sense. That is the bonus weather video for today. Uh, I will be traveling tomorrow, but I will try to come up with something, some sort of a bonus weather video for you so that we'll get our three in for this week. And uh, that's it for now. So you all have a great Tuesday evening, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. See you later.